My name is Lawrence Schiller. For those that maybe don't recognize me, I'm the president and the co-founder with Norman's wife, Norris, of the Norman Mailer Center in Writers Colony. And I really greet you here tonight at this second annual benefit because I had this just incredible relationship with Norman for over 35 years. That relationship was not only founded on work. We did work together, but we impacted each other's lives and we each changed as we grew. But I do want to say something which is very important, and that is that the Mailer Center promotes writers as people of action, those who are driven to make sense of the times in which we live, just as Norman did throughout his life. Talking with the Council of Writers, Joan Didion, Colin McCann, Bill Kennedy, and many, many members of the community that have come to aid me, we know that we must encourage and celebrate writers who challenge their own readers' perspectives on the world and the world that we live in. Elena Newhouse is with us, and she is the editor-in-chief of The Tablet. She went to the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism, and she is um, a writer for various periodicals, done obits and op-eds and magazine pieces for the New York Times. And she's here to um, give the Distinguished Journalism and Humanitarian Prize this evening. So I give you Ilana. Thank you. It is my honor to present the Distinguished Journalism and Humanitarianism Prize to one of my personal heroines, Ruth Gruber. When Ruth was a young woman, her father, a modern thinking man, told her that though he'd hoped that she'd marry a good boy and have babies, she should also think of having some sort of job in case the husband died, he said. When he asked her what she might want to do, she replied simply, I want to be a writer. His response, what kind of career is that for a nice Jewish girl? It turned out to be a career like none other. Ruth Gruber was born in Brooklyn, one of five children of Russian immigrant parents. At the age of 18, she won a postgraduate fellowship at the University of Wisconsin and in 1931, won another fellowship to study in Cologne, Germany, where she later became the youngest person in the world to receive a PhD. While in Germany, Ruth witnessed numerous Nazi rallies, and after completing her studies and returning to America, she brought back with her the awareness of the dangers of Nazism. In 1935, the New York Herald Tribune asked her to write a feature series about women under fascism and communism. While working for the Herald Tribune, she became the first foreign correspondent to fly through Siberia into the Soviet Arctic. During World War II, Secretary of the Interior Harold Ickes appointed Ruth his special assistant. In his notes, Ickes said of Ruth, she is a writer and a lecturer and the youngest PhD in the world. Dr. Gruber is very attractive and is actually quite good looking. I couldn't quite make out if she's Jewish or not, but she may be. Anyhow, I confess I fell for her line. I suspect she is an imperious young woman who likes to have her way. She did indeed. In 1944, Ruth was assigned a secret mission to bring 1,000 Jewish refugees from Europe to the United States. When they arrived, instead of being offered assistance and care, the refugees were transferred to an army base and locked behind a chain link fence. While government agencies argued about whether they should be allowed to stay, Ruth lobbied to keep them through the end of the war. In January 1946, the decision was made to allow them to apply for American residency. This was the only attempt by the United States to shelter Jewish refugees during the war. In 1947, after returning to journalism, Ruth witnessed the exodus ship entering the Israeli port of Haifa 
after it was attacked by the Royal Navy while making an attempt to deliver 4,500 Jewish refugees. After an 18-day standoff, the British decided to ship the Jews back to Germany. Of the many journalists from around the world reporting on the affair, Ruth alone was allowed by the British to accompany the refugees back to Germany. Aboard the prison ship, Gruber photographed the refugees, confined in a cage with barbed wire on top, defiantly raising a Union Jack on which they had painted a swastika. When Ruth approached one of the survivors for an interview, he refused. How can we tell you, a young woman, about the atrocities we experienced? Ruth told him, forget about me being a woman. Focus on the fact that you're a witness. We now have a short slideshow of some of Ruth's photographs for you. Ruth Gruber is a woman and a humanitarian and a journalist, and though she is only recently receiving her dues as such, a documentary photographer of the First Order. Indeed, it is my pleasure to announce tonight that in May of 2011, the International Center of Photography will present an exhibit of her work for the first time. Please welcome me in presenting the Distinguished Journalism and Humanitarianism Award to Ruth Gruber. Thank you, Alana. Can you all hear me? But you can't see me. <laughs> Thank you for that beautiful introduction. It's such an honor to be here tonight to know what this community that meets here tonight is doing for beginning journalists. There was no such thing when I was entering journalism. We just knew that we had to write, and those of us who were lucky enough to get jobs made our own way through the field. All of you here who are helping young journalists become good journalists, open their hearts to what they're doing. Edward Steichen said to me one day, take pictures with your heart. I believe that I began to take everything with my heart. And I have two tools with which to work, my words and my images, my cameras, and my typewriter, little Hermes typewriter, which I could afford to carry around because it weighed two pounds. Everybody in this big, huge room has tools. We must all look in our souls and find those tools. And when we find them, we can not only train young journalists and young people making their way, but maybe we can help make peace in this world. Thank you so much. It's a, <clears throat> it's a personal honor for me to be introducing <clears throat> a man who has been a friend for half a century and a writer that I've admired like no other. <clears throat> I think in my generation, there is not a more versatile writer than Tom Wolfe, a man whose nonfiction created a form that no one else <clears throat> could emulate and certainly not imitate. And they moved <clears throat> from nonfiction to fiction with the same success, the same style, and the same courage. He is Richmond's gift to New York, and he's well known and admired by everyone in this room. And I'm so honored to introduce you to him, though it does not mean 
you have to be introduced at all to Tom Wolfe because you all know him and admire him. Tom. Thank you very much, Gay. And I want everybody to know that when I first came to New York to work on a newspaper, there was only one reporter under the age of 35 who had a beautiful wife and a townhouse and could invite you to parties constantly at Gay Talese. <laughs> now, I want to talk tonight about another uh, great man, uh, Jan Winner. I know most of you know him as a media baron, a baron. Um, but you have to realize from where he started. I, I, let me just give you one second how I met Jan Winner. Um, he had this little magazine called Rolling Stone out in San Francisco in a, in a, in a, in a uh, uh, loft. And he got in touch with me, and he, he, I had been writing some magazine pieces, and he wanted me to do a piece <clears throat> on... Um, the National Association of Record Merchandisers, better known as the Rack Jobbers. Uh, I wasn't really interested in that, to tell you the truth, but I was, I was sort of curious to meet him. Uh, and sure enough, he arrives at my, uh, my house, or actually my six-story walker, uh, <clears throat> with um, a limousine that was owned by a, run by a company called Head Limo. A Head Limo had a curious windows, all the windows were darkened, including the windshield, <laughs> because the, the, their clientele was mainly music uh, industry um, heads, if you will. Uh, and so I get in the back seat. Jan Winter at that time had a, wore a page boy bob down, down to about, about here, and, and he was clean, he was clean shaven. Um, as you can see tonight, uh, Things are different now. Jan has moved the hair to the jaws, and he's lifted it on the, on the sides. And I discovered Jan has a fantastic electric razor. You can set it for the days. He sets his for 17 days. I just, you know, it's, it's fabulous. I, I don't know who, 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 who thinks of it. Anyway, uh, the driver for Head Limo was a nice looking young man with a tremendous ponytail coming out the back and had a bandana on and at first the only curious thing about him was that uh, he kept throwing the I Ching on a tambourine in the front seat. Uh, you don't run into that every, every day. I knew we were in for a strange ride and, uh, and Jan, this, this guy goes careening down the street. Jan's telling me about the National Association of Record Merchandisers. I'm terrified so after about eight blocks I said, I'll do it, I'll do it. So I went down to uh, uh, to Miami, the rack jobbers are the people who take, uh, among other things, they take records and put them in department stores or 7-Elevens, uh, wherever people sold uh, uh, records. They were the fiercest music critics in America. They judged music solely by how much money it brought in per square foot, and I'm not kidding, uh, whether it's a department store or a 7-Eleven. A uh, uh, it would have been... A, a, it would have been one of the greatest stories of all time if I had, well, anyway. The, um, uh, on the, the culmination of the, of the uh, Iraq Jobbers Convention was a big banquet. And so they had gotten as, as uh, music uh, to play at the, at the banquet, the Chambers Brothers. I don't know how many of you remember the Chambers Brothers. Um, the Chambers Brothers, great musicians, great musicians, but they made the mistake of playing, their first number was 17 minutes long. When the house lights came up, there was about six people left in this huge banquet hall, bigger, bigger than this probably. But anyway, that was when I first realized that we had a, uh, a special number in this, uh, in, in this Jan winner. Uh, Jan flouted every rule of journalism at the time. Uh, the conventional wisdom was, and apparently still is, that the young uh, have very short attention spans. You've got to make it brief and simple. Uh, he, John, would just let it run. It helped that it was he was letting Hunter Thompson run, uh, but it was no, it was really no limit as long as it was uh, as long as it was good. Uh, in photography, who is it that launches Annie Leibovitz? 
um, but, uh, but yeah, and also Cameron Crowe, Joe Esterhaus, all, all sorts of numerous writers. And in, in terms of makeup, uh, Rolling Stone used to be tabloid size. And instead of, at that time, the fashion was clean, crisp graphics and a lot of white space. Jan had Rolling Stone made up like the old sporting news from the 1930s. Oxford lines, they called them, boxing every, uh, every story. It was a circus, so-called circus makeup. But it worked, it worked, right? because it was, uh, it, it, was, it was so different. Um, from there, as you may know, Jan is, now has many publications. One of them is the magazine uh, Us Weekly, uh, that in it by itself stopped the slide in the American birth rate by publishing all the celebrity bumps, you know, the, 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 the girls who are uh, pregnant. I'm not kidding you. He, he's, he got a special uh, award. It's, um, uh, uh, but Rolling Stone just went uh, from, uh, and he played such a, I'll just finish with this, he played such a great part in my career as he did in, in many others. Because I never somehow got around to writing about the rack choppers, I felt the guilt was just pouring through my whole nervous system. So when he asked me to do a story on the launch of Apollo 17, that was the last voyage to the moon by NASA, I, could, I had to say yes. Uh, he ended up publishing a four-part series by me. Uh, the only piece that I know of that was ever written in the first person plural. Now I've seen people write in the second person singular. You're on the runway, Chuck Yeager, and you're revving up the engine. And you know this is going to be the flight of your life. Or, or your, that, that's fairly common. But we? This, the whole story was we. And it eventually uh, became uh, the book, uh, The Right Stuff, which didn't feature we too much. Um, then, get this, my next book, I had decided I was going to do a novel about New York. I'd never done one before, and I tell you, it terrified me. You find out you can do anything if you have a novel. My God, non-fiction, they hand you the characters, and you more or less have the plot. Uh, I, just, I just froze, and I figured I had to get somebody to let me write it under a deadline. I knew there was only one person in New York crazy enough to do it, uh, and that was Jan Winner. So I started writing The Bonfire of the Vanities uh, for Rolling Stone against a uh, deadline like Dickens, in the sense of a deadline. Um, and uh, uh, Jan kind of liked the first three installments. I had no backup. He ran all three in the first issue. Now, for about eight weeks, I'm gasping, gasping for breath, trying to just fill the hole. Never mind literary. Uh, uh, literary uh, uh, magnificence, uh, but he did it. I mean, and I don't think I would have ever gotten that book done if I hadn't first written it under the whip uh, at, uh, at, at Rolling Stone. I have given very honest tribute to Jan in every book since then. Uh, a man in full, he, he uh, I am Charlotte Simmons, he, he would walk me through the roughest part of the, uh, uh, of the valley of the shadow of weary writing. Um, and I will, I will be e eternally uh, uh, grateful. Uh, when he spotted what seems like a small thing, the fact that popular music had broke its bonds with ballroom dancing, that's what the foxtrot was, really, ballroom dancing, and going into something completely new, he saw this was something important enough to create a whole magazine out of. And he is the one who almost single-handedly brought the realization of the importance of the youth culture uh, and of rock and roll uh, uh, to the country. I don't want him to get a swell head, so I'm just going to invite him on up here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Jan Winner winning the uh, prize uh, for Lifetime uh, work as an editor. That's not meant to sound posthumous, um, but yeah. Well, thank you, Tom, and, and um, thank you, Larry Schiller and Tina Brown, for this honor. And uh, 
name of Norman Mailer, and that's a uh, heavy-duty title for any recognition or award. And I hope in the years to come it will be at least as important as those named for the inventor of dynamite or the father of yellow journalism. And Norman falls somewhere in between the two. <laughs> One thing that makes this award so special is that Norman wrote with uh, Larry Schiller here the Executioner's Song which, as a piece of reporting and writing, is one of the greatest achievements in journalism of the last century. <laughs> to me, the other great master of this in our times is Tom Wolfe. I was enthralled with his writing before I started Rolling Stone, and he was a tremendous influence on my early thinking of what could and should be done, and he was the first uh, name or establishment writer I sought out, even as we were uh, still an upstart magazine in San Francisco. So I, now the meeting where I picked him out his townhouse and had limo, that's all true, but preceded that, I discovered that he was actually living in San Francisco. So we met as an, we met as an apartment for the first time, and he was there researching Mau Mau and the Flat Catchers, which is a great piece about Chinatown, which you all should find out. So in the course of all this, he told me he had never taken acid while researching his book on Kesey and the Merry Pranksters to my great disbelief. But then I saw him penetrate every other culture he ever chose to drop into, and soon enough, as he mentioned, in 1970, I hired him to ask, lured him to do a uh, piece on record business in Miami and uh, to begin a take on that culture. That never materialized, but thereafter he, shortly thereafter, he accepted our assignment to report on the last moonshot, and it went from there. So I'm often asked, what's it like to edit Tom Wolf? The trick with Tom is just stay out of the way and be patient. The only really proactive thing uh, you can do as an editor for Tom is to maintain the pretense that there's some reasonable deadline that Tom is trying to meet. And then, after that, you reluctantly agree that another six months will be just fine. And then it's another six. And finally, you get tough on him and you crack down and you say it's three months. Anyway. There was never a factual inaccuracy in all the many years and many projects that we did together. Perhaps a dozen word choices I might have suggested changing, not a sentence structure, however baroque, that you would want to even tweak. This was the master at work. And working with Tom has been one of the great pleasures and great honors of my life as an editor. Thank you, Tom. Now, Every, every writer requires some individual and personalized form of editing. Sometimes, as in the case of Hunter Thompson, it's a full body contact sport. Hunter was also a genius of words, a student of sentence structure and rhythm. His humor was acid and deep and dark, and uh, he himself was a charismatic and volatile mix of charm and danger and anger and idealism, and he was one of the great voices of our times. And it was my greatest collaboration, in part because he needed so much attention, in part because it was always a magical experience to be with him, but especially because of his completely eccentric working habits and hours, mixed with a news deadline, well, really mixed with any kind of deadline, where some portion of what he turned in was in a, several stages of completion, a few leads, some fragments, maybe the end, which would usually be written first. And all this required high speed, collaborative editing, instincts, a lot of tolerance, a lot of love, and those are years I wouldn't trade in for anything. Rolling Stone has been a magazine, especially it's been journalism and report. We follow the news, we get involved in stories that are topical, that are important, that are meaningful, that can change or should change politics, people's lives, people's enjoyment of their lives. We've always wanted to have a voice in the national conversation, and an in-depth, serious reporting has been our place at the table. And as a music magazine, a cultural magazine, a political magazine, and a news magazine, all wrapped into one, working with so many of the best writers and journalists of our times has given me the most enviable perch from which to watch the world go by. I've enjoyed being a part of the culture and the politics of the past four decades. And I've done it not only through my own eyes, but through the eyes of our writers. And to read a great piece of writing, and to revel sometimes in a choice of words, or images, a crisp sentence, a moment of powerful insight, a newly found fact, 
an argument that makes a difference, to match an idea of your own <clears throat> with the right writer, <clears throat> or to get someone to do their best work, is all so fully exciting to me even now. And then perhaps you help to make it a little bit or a lot bit better. Well, that's a real honor. <clears throat> These days, magazine editing has become more than the words. You're also a jack of all trades. You're a packager, a creative director, an ambassador, an ad sales emissary. You're a pan cultural, you're supposed to be an intellectual omnivore, you're an omniscient, multitasking executive, and, and now on top of everything else, you are got to be a celebrity wrangler and an internet guru. Uh, it's a lot of fun, all in all, and sometimes it gets you into the Oval Office as a result. My first effort in journalism and publishing was a neighborhood newspaper I founded at age nine, produced on a ditto machine, later upgraded to a mimeograph as the nickels rolled in. During its nine months life, its most celebrated exploit, uh, wholly unfortunate, but today we'd call it a scoop, was the publication of the news from a fellow fourth grader that his parents were getting divorced. Well, I looked through a copy of this effort a few years ago and was shocked to see that I had also written an editorial, age nine, protesting the rise in the first class postage stamp rates to three cents. All of that was an early indication of my interest in both gossip, national affairs, and the cost of postage for publishers. The name of this effort was the Weekly Trumpet, grandiose, but that says it all. So as to why I'm a good magazine editor and why I'm getting this award tonight, I've just been doing it longer than anybody else, and I'm still standing. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart. It is my uh, final, final honor of the evening <clears throat> to introduce you to one of the great editors of our city. Came here in the 1980s, Vanity Fair for a while was the editor, then later on The New Yorker, now The Daily Beast a woman who married well, who's kept her friends, known as many, many, many friends in this room, this room tonight because she's been so generous with her time, <clears throat> her advice, and of course that generous spirit she's had through all of her relationships <clears throat> professionally and personally. So, Tina Brown, thank you for being here. And um, Jan, one editor to another, write that memoir. You've really got to get it done. <laughs> Wonderful stuff from you. Um, well, we're here tonight to celebrate a writer and a man that I think Norman Mailer would have greatly appreciated. Although a little more retiring than Norman, and frankly, who isn't, he still wields a mighty pen and speaks with a voice unafraid of telling the truth. Much of his fiction may be set in the past, but he has nonetheless and somewhat reluctantly become a political figure drawn into the fray that Norman so relished. His books have been banned, burned, his life threatened. His trial on charges of insulting Turkishness was seen as a bellwether for his country's entrance into the EU. He acknowledged the Armenian genocide to a Swiss magazine. For a time, he had to leave his home and come to America. His list of awards is amazingly long and crowned with a Nobel. And his work intricate, elegant, and yet playful, and his gentle demeanor hiding a fierce vision of the world. Orhan Pamuk has become our essential man at the center of our global divide. He sits comfortably between East and West. He salutes Proust, teaches the history of the novel at Columbia, and he's even building a museum in Istanbul. But it's for his novels as much as his life that we're celebrating him tonight. From his postmodern detective tale, The Black Book, to his sweeping account of Islam in Turkey, Snow, to his stunning love story, Museum of Innocence. Orhan Pamuk has been a writer unafraid, much like Norman Mailer, to wrestle with the big themes of our day and to experiment with the boundaries of literature itself. In his Nobel speech, Pamuk said, I believe literature to be the most valuable tool that humanity has found in its quest to understand itself. 
And I can think of no truer reflection of what all of us here are celebrating tonight and what the spirit of Norma Mailer means to us all. Tonight, Orhan, it's my great honor to present you this award in the spirit and memory of Norman Mailer for your deeply meaningful and important work and for making literature the force that forces us to look into the world with fresh eyes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tina. So kind of you. Thank you so much, Norman Mailer Foundation, Mr. Schiller, for everybody here. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful. This tonight began with Mr. Schiller's words. He said, Norman, I, Norman and I. I'll finish the night with Norman and I. My father had the paperback edition of the, uh, the Naked and the Dead. I think it was a signet edition, tattered old book, which I have read. Then he had The Deer Park, which I have read. But I cared a lot. Um, then I also read The Armies of the Night, which stayed with me. Great books. Advertisements for myself, a very experimental, fragmentary book, which um, heralds the new um, the, um, postmodernist books, fragmentary books that will be written in 20 years later. All of those books stayed with me. I have learned a lot from them in 1970s in Turkey when I was trying to make myself a Turkish novelist. Cut to 15 years later, 1985, I came to the United States for the first time. Then I went to Strand. I didn't have much money. And I saw then Plimpton's book on Norman Mailer, which I really bought, you know, paperback discount very cheaply. Um, immediately went home and read. Um, learned a lot about Norman Mailer again, but it was also a sort of a survey of whole American literary scene, which I wanted to learn about. Uh, but that book also, but the atmosphere in 85, showed obviously this fact, which was obvious that I understood this Norman Mailer, which my father re read 20 years ago, now is the Victor Hugo of American literature. Um, what did I uh, what that, uh, with Victor Hugo I mean? A person who is deeply embedded in his times, a person who is writing panoramas, chronologies of his times, a person who is taking risks, who has an immense ego, right, has an immense energy of, uh, verbal energy of seeing everything, embracing world, the huge America with words. And I liked it. I admired not only early books, but this continuous struggle, continuous challenge, continuous desire to fight, find causes, fight back, continue and continue. Not only I admired, but I was also a bit, especially at the beginning, beginning uh, in my modest way, I wanted to be a writer too. And I was looking, wow, God, you know, Victor Hugo in America, and I'm a Turkish writer, no one reads. I was, of course, a bit slightly jealous. You will pardon me for that, because those of you who know Norman Mailer closely would also know that, along with his great talents, great verbal energy, he had a great capacity to make men, especially um, writerly men, to be jealous. Tonight, I'm grateful to Norman Mailer Foundation that we are settling scores with this <laughs> jealousy. Very grateful for that. From now on, no jealousy. Thank you very much.